Professional Ethics for CPAs, What the Rules Say and How to Interpret Them was a live webinar that was originally produced on Thursday, August 30th, 2018. For this webinar, we were joined by two of our partners here at McConley and Asbury, Mike Hoffner and Janice Snyder. We hope you enjoy this recap and please visit us online at www.macpas.com for more information about other future webinars and all of our upcoming events. Great. Thanks, Dan. Good afternoon. My name is Janice Snyder. I'm a partner here at McConley and Asbury, and I lead our audit segment along with Mike Hoffner, and we'll be presenting to you today on ethics and the professional code of conduct. So our objectives today are to look at the standard setting process and then walk you through the code of conduct. So it's now been in place for three years. So um, we'll walk back through it, give you some relevant and timely examples, and hopefully none of you ever need it, but we'll wrap up with the enforcement process. I know many of you are here today needing your ethics credits. This is a very popular webinar, and we're glad you could join us. So our first slide is just to look at ethics in the news. And a lot of times when I think of ethics in the news, it has a really negative slant. And we'll look at those next. But I thought it would be great to take a moment and just celebrate some of the world's most ethical companies, as you see listed here. So you certainly see some large companies, some big names, many of which I'm sure you are familiar. Um, and I think it's great to just celebrate these companies who are known for their strong ethics and their strong values. Hopefully your company could be one of them. I'll make them maybe not large enough. Um, hopefully your company is very ethical as well. In terms of ethics in the news, this is, I think, what we're more used to seeing, the more negative side of that. So if you look back over the last two decades, um, I don't think anyone in the profession has missed the, you know, the Madoff scandal, Enron, which fundamentally changed the way we did just about everything, and Sarbanes-Oxley came about from that, Parmalat, WorldCom, Jordan Belfort. I'm sure you could all list several um, that have happened and really impacted the profession. Some of these here are some 2017 and 2018 examples of the Perigo and Price collusion, um, where they had some prices going up over 400% in just a few months. So that made the news last November. Um, Bitcoin savings and trust already with trend and shavers had a Ponzi scheme going on. Um, we, we had Wells Fargo going on with their aggressive sales culture noted there and a lot of their apology commercials that you got to see over the last six months that they know they can do better. Um, so at least they're trying to improve. We had the Equifax uh, data breach, which impacted um, millions and millions of individuals. And, and on a local level, we have some recent press on a company, um, Worley and Obits, so that's been out there. So we hope to see that resolved. So anything you want to add on those, Mike? No, I think the, the challenging thing when we talk about professional ethics, particularly for the CPA, is we, we automatically gravitate towards these, um, these high-profile, front-page, above-the-fold kind of stories. Um, but as we'll talk about the, the rules and responsibilities of a CPA, whether in public practice or in private practice or corporate, um, the, there's far more instances of fraud uh, by quantity in small business, in nonprofits, in small family-owned businesses. It happens over and over, and so while we, we highlight some of these larger ones and we talk about the, as I said, above-the-fold, front-page kind of stories, uh, equally, um, equally as important to us, and, and the rules are equally applicable to helping us avoid things uh, that happen on the, the ninth page or the 10th page or the 12th page where a treasurer of a small community foundation uh, was was taking funds or there was an insolvency issue with an organization and an accountant tried to help them uh, cover it up just to continue another year or two of the good work they do. Uh, those are things are, are, in my mind, every bit as important as the things that are on the screen. Um, and we don't talk about them enough. We don't talk about the significant uh, issues that build up in, in small, small dollars, small quantities. But they're things that our profession uh, as, as CPAs, our profession is charged with helping to avoid. So uh, I think it's always important to point that out. Sure. The, okay. the standard setting process, um, 
is one that uh, has not changed in a long time. Uh, the as, as you can see on the current slide, we go back to, to 1906 when there was a designated body for the first time uh, expecting to, to make rules and interpretations on ethics for CPAs to follow. Uh, the most current form, the Professional Ethics Executive Committee, has been around since 1971 uh, and since then has been charged with continuing to enhance and improve the interpretations and rulings that govern uh, what we do. So a few years ago, as Janice said, when the the, um, the rules changed dramatically, and the code of professional conduct changed very significantly. Uh, it was a it was a pretty significant milestone. Uh, things had looked the same for a long time. The the professional ethics executive committee had focused heavily on uh, interpretations, on enhancements to rules, on trying to give rulings, uh, and a number of years ago it became very apparent that the way the standards were written uh, were written for a time before uh, the era that we live in today, between technology, between ability to communicate, between ability to change things, uh, fraud and the depth and breadth of fraud and the ways to cover it up. Uh, the old rules weren't working anymore, so the, the executive committee rolled up their sleeves, dug in, and uh, we're going to spend most of the next hour talking about what they came out with, because it hasn't changed really since then. Uh, so the executive committee is really charged with um, making sure that the rules stay relevant. Uh, they meet quarterly. Those meetings are open to the public. You can go on the AICPA's website and navigate to the executive committee. You can see agendas. Sometimes I've found when I tried to click on them, and I'll be honest, I don't read them all the time, um, but when I tried to click on them, say, I don't know, in, in preparation for a webinar we're about to do, uh, sometimes you can't get through. So uh, they are out there. They are open meetings. The agendas are lengthy. They look mind-numbing to me, uh, but if you're interested, you are certainly more than welcome to join them as they travel the country on this wonderful roadshow. Um, but their job is really simple. It's interpret the code and it's hold people accountable to comply with the code and make sure that uh, we're doing the right thing from a, a global ethics per perspective in our, our industry. Great. Thanks, Mike. So as he said, we're going to spend a few minutes just walking through the code of professional conduct. That's actually about the next 30 minutes of our webinar. So we have a couple of discussion points in there. So it starts with a preface, which is a little over 20 pages long, and that applies to all members. And then they've broken it down into three parts so that you can kind of quickly find what impacts you. So there's members in public practice, which is the majority of the code. The entire code is 180 pages. The members in public practice are um, almost 120 of those 180 pages. And then we move on to members in business. So that certainly affects everyone and some of the day-to-day -day decisions and the things that they're doing. And then all other members that don't fall into those two buckets that are retired, unemployed, taking a break, or anything of that nature. So that, that's pretty short and just focuses on acts discreditable. Yeah, and one of the one of the things to bear in mind is while this is a AICPA document and it governs uh, CPAs and members of the AICPA, uh, most organizations, uh, particularly when looking at folks uh, who are non CPAs but working in either public accounting uh, or in business, but in a finance department or an accounting department, I believe you would find that most organizations uh, would would expect employees to adhere to these rules. So if you read the introduction to the code, it's very clear that the AICPA is a voluntary membership organization, and these rules are applicable to anybody who is a member and holds themselves out as a CPA. Uh, but I think it's important that uh, non-CPAs pay attention to this as well. And, and I'm not sure how many of those we have on the, the line today. Um, most of you are probably looking for the ethics credit, and if you're looking for the ethics credit, then you're you're not um, you are licensed. Uh, but I think the individuals who are not licensed should still certainly have a great understanding of what's in this document because it's a it's a governing document for our profession and what we do, not just the folks who have the license. Yeah, I think for those members in business, you probably have a team of individuals working underneath you that are supporting you in your organization, and and they should be thinking about adhering to this as well. And hopefully, that's how you would want them to behave. So the Code of Professional Conduct is a conceptual framework. So it really focuses, as it says here, on a threats and safeguards approach. So it goes through a lot of what is a threat, what are different types of threats, and we'll walk through the ones, um, the, really the seven that they identify in the code. Um, how do you identify that threat? D do you know what they all are and where, when you need to start asking questions? You need to then evaluate the significance of that threat to see 
the significance of the threat and see, do I potentially have a problem here? And then um, if you haven't been able to resolve the threat, you, if you can't reduce it to an acceptable level, you have to apply safeguards to try and eliminate the threat or reduce it to an acceptable level. So on the next page, we have a picture of that. And I think as, as you go to that, Janice, one of the things that is important for for folks to consider and think about is this idea of of in fact and in appearance. And we used to use those words a lot, and we don't really use them as much anymore. Um, but reality is you can sit down and say, I go through and identify these threats, and I come to the conclusion that, in fact, it's not really a threat or it's not a significant threat. Um, but I think the, the code requires and our profession requires that you step back and say, what would an independent observer think about this? Or what would somebody who's, uh, who's working at a client, if you're in public practice, think about this in a, in a relationship? Uh, so it's not just about the decisions we make, but we have to interpret uh, our, our ideas and thoughts on what others would think about those as well. Sure. And in a few more slides, we're going to walk through exactly what the threats are. And there's seven of them and six of the seven apply to members in business as well. So I think you're right. The the in fact and appearance is prevalent. It's still there. It's in the independence rules, but it also applies to those of you in business. So you start with, as we said, identifying the threats. So if you say I have no threats, you can proceed and continue with what you were going to do. If um, If there is a potential threat, you then have to evaluate that threat and you have to say, oh, you know what, you know, I'm working with this organization, I'm working for my company, and this vendor offered me a $20 ticket to, to a senator's game. And you say, that's okay. Um, in my circumstances and my relationship with them, I think that threat is not significant. It's just an example. Maybe in your example, it is. It depends. Um, so you have to evaluate that threat. If it's not significant, then you can proceed and say, that's not significant. I can accept this $20 ticket. Now, if it was a $2,000 ticket for some major event like the Super Bowl, probably not the case. Uh, but you're going to have to evaluate that for yourself, in, given your facts and circumstances. Um, as you're evaluating it, you say, you know what, I actually do have a threat here. And I need to move forward and identify, are there safeguards? So are there safeguards already in place? So existing safeguards. Don't worry, we're going to walk through threats and safeguards in a lot of detail. So um, do we have existing safeguards in place, either through the profession or through the organization that I work with or through my training and education? Or are there new safeguards that I need to put in place? Does someone need to review this work? Does someone have the suitable skill, knowledge, and experience to take responsibility for this work? Things like that. Um, and then you have to look at those safeguards, evaluate the safeguards, and if they are not acceptable, you have to stop and you should not proceed with what you are doing because you could have a violation. And if you, they are acceptable and you have reduced that threat through those safeguards, then you may proceed. Yeah, and we, we often think, uh, particularly those in public practice, but I think folks in uh, business and industry uh, often interpret this as its independence. And, and we will talk about it, but in, independence is a big part of it, without a question. Uh, but as we get into these threats, you'll find that there's far more to it than just, am I independent as a, a test function would require? Um, and the, it's, it's really more about, will my objectivity in the service I'm performing be impaired because of some of these threats? Will that $20 ticket cause me to overlook something uh, that maybe I wouldn't have overlooked in a, in a relationship or in an audit? Uh, will that $20 ticket cause me to maybe go to bat a little bit harder with a regulator to make sure that um, my friend continues to get the funding they need or whatnot? Um, the other thing I think that's important on this slide, I wish I had a laser pointer that you could all see, uh, but right underneath step two is the, the concept of threats not significant proceed. Uh, and I think you need to think through um, almost like a a layering on of various threats. And, and I don't think we'll get into that a lot later, but this idea of identifying a threat is not significant is great in and of itself. And, and to Janice's example, that $20 ticket to a, a senator's game is not significant in and of itself, uh, but that $20 ticket plus I'm going to Disney on ice with the same individual on their dime, plus they took me out to lunch three times last month, uh, plus they're sending me a Jelly of the Month Club subscription just because they're nice people. 
people. Uh, I think we have to layer a pile of those threats that we might identify as not significant individually, and we layer them on and have to think about, uh, am I creating a pattern that would cause that threat to no longer be insignificant? Uh, and so that's something really important to think through that we, we very often focus on a one-off. It is a it's a twenty dollar ticket to a senator's game. Honestly, unless you're in a uh, in a, a governmental world or something that doesn't allow any kind of entertainment, which there's a lot of that, and that's a wonderful way to keep things clean. Um, but it's very easy to justify a one off and then a second one a few weeks later or months later. Um, we very quickly can lose our perspective on when that becomes insignificant to when the aggregation of those threats becomes significant. Great, thanks, Mike. So let's talk about just some little humor on a Thursday afternoon. So this one, exactly how badly do we want to reach our projections? Um, so I think this happens on some level at a lot of organizations. I think it really crosses the line with we told the bank this, we told the investors this, um, you know, our board is expecting that and a lot of pressure to really hit. Maybe it's that bottom line number or we were going to break even if you're a nonprofit or we were going to be positive for the first time this year. So how hard are you looking at that numbers and what kind of pressure are you putting on the organization? I think there's always a little bit because you want to be diligent in what you're doing. The question is, are you willing to start changing your reserves? Are you willing to make an argument that, you know, what, we don't really need this much of an allowance or we need more of an allowance or let's look at those estimates and really start tweaking them and really manipulating them to manage to a certain expectation. And I think that's where you're starting to cross that line. You're managing to the expectation as opposed to reporting on how the business is actually performing. And it becomes very gray because there are so many things in the accounting standards that allow latitude in interpretation, right? And so it's very easy to say, well, this is still an allowable method to do what I'm doing, mm -hmm. or I can make this conclusion uh, and I'm not doing anything wrong because I'm, I'm not lying, cheating, and stealing, right? I'm just adjusting my estimate. And by mm -hmm. adjusting my estimate, I'm still well within what the standards allow that estimate to be. Uh, and I think depending on your motives, regardless of whether it's allowable under the accounting standards or the nature of the transaction you're dealing with, your motives could drive that exact same change in estimate into a very, very dicey ethical area, particularly then when you start asking folks around you, if you're in, in corporate or if you're in, if you're in public accounting and asking to make sure we can get something tweaked to help our client out. Now you're not only drawing a line that, that you're crossing, but you're also asking others to cross it with you. So uh, I think we often think that it's, well, it's, I can do it either way. It's, you know, the rules are gray. I can interpret it either way I want. So I'm going to go this way this year. Uh, but the motives are what make it different. Mm -hmm. And then the next one, I just, maybe Mike and I will find more amusing than the rest of you, but I'd like to, I'd like you to do a business uh, presentation on business ethics. If you don't have time to repair something, just seal it off the internet. I can assure you we did not. We have written these slides ourselves, um, although the concepts come right out of the standards. So, But we did borrow some of these cartoons, but they're appropriately copyrighted. So <laughs> um, one more cartoon, and then we'll go back to walking through um, the code itself. So have you taken the mandatory training for business ethics? No, but if you say I did, then you'll save some money on training, which you can spend to decorate your office. Luckily, I haven't taken the training myself. I hear it's mostly common sense anyway. I just like that final statement about being mostly common sense anyway, because I think if you step back, a lot of what we do and a lot of what's in the code should be common sense. But I think going through the examples and talking it through and just thinking, could this be a threat? Did I even recognize it as a threat? It's good to take this hour and pause and reflect upon some of those things. This clearly is a violation if you're not going to take the training, but say you did. It, it makes me laugh, too, because um, if, if you look at some of the enforcement actions uh, over the last decade on people who have violated the ethics standards, you'll find that there's a lot of different things that go into it. Some of those some of those enforcement actions are your suspended, your license is suspended. Maybe you can't practice in front of the SEC. But one of the common themes that always comes with it is uh, you are unethical. So we're going to send you to ethics training. So part of your punishment, if you will, to prove that you're on the right track is to go get four hours or eight hours of ethics training, um, to which I look at and, and I chuckle because 
it is mostly common sense. And if you, I get mistakes are made, but if you blatantly violated the ethical standards before that were pretty common sense, then eight hours of training on ethics isn't going to help. So I think um, it's wonderful that we all have to get ethics hours and that we're on calls like this and we read articles and we make sure that we're, we're getting the proper ethics training. But, but reality is, it's mostly common sense. And if you have a, a decent amount of judgment and some good common sense, um, you don't necessarily need the training to make sure that you stay ethical. Thanks, Mike. So now we're going to walk through the preface, which applies to all members. So this is a little over 20 pages here, and it walks through basically the six principles, which should really be the foundation, and they are the foundation of the Code of Conduct. So the responsibilities principle, public interest, integrity, objectivity and independence, which comes up quite a lot, the due care principle, and the scope and nature of services. So as we walk through each one of these, we start with the responsibilities principle, so in carrying out their responsibilities as professionals, members should exercise sensitive professional and moral judgments in all their activities. So as you'll see in each one of these principles, they load a lot into them. So when they talk about the responsibilities principle, it's a lot about training and education, the responsibility to cooperate with each other to improve the art of accounting. That language was into the art of accounting uh, to maintain public confidence and to have the self-governance of the profession. So we're really responsible to not only govern ourselves with these moral and ethical judgments, but to govern other CPAs as well. So there's a lot laid into that responsibilities principle. The next principle is the public interest principle. Members should accept the obligation to act in a way that will serve the public interest. Oh, always a reminder that we are public servants. Honor the public trust and demonstrate a commitment to professionalism. So it's really focusing on that responsibility to the public with our dedication to professional excellence is the words that they use in there. And we need to show that professional excellence in everything we do every day. The next one is the integrity principle. So to maintain and broaden public confidence, members should perform all professional responsibilities with the highest sense of integrity and it really focuses on being honest, candid, right, and just in everything that we do. Um, so there's some pretty strong words when you read the, these principles. And I think it's important that they're strong words to make sure it really gets all of our attention and say the public is watching us and this is what they expect from their CPAs. In terms of objectivity and independence, um, we could do a couple day training just on this one, but is that a member should maintain objectivity and be free of conflict of interest. And a member in public practice should be independent in fact and appearance when providing auditing and other at test services. So there's about 80 pages just on that independence, in fact, and appearance within the standards. So lots of rules we could go through there, um, but we'll focus a lot today on ob objectivity and independence. Moving on to the fifth principle, it's the due care principle. And a member should observe the profession's technical and ethical standards and strive continually to improve competence and the quality of services. Um, and as it focuses on this, it talks about a quest for excellence is required by all of the members and that the competence really goes back to education and experience. So it's important that we're continually learning, continually growing and really understanding those both technical and ethical standards. Um, it also says within the due care principle that we have to be prompt, careful and thorough. And, and then the last one is scope and nature of services principle. So a member in public practice should observe the principles of the code in determining the scope and nature of all the services they provide. And they must consider and evaluate all the previous principles as they're considering taking on a new service. I feel like there's so many heady, high-end, wonderful words and concepts that <laughs> you, you, I'll do respect, Janice, we're not doing it justice. You need a <laughs> you need a James Earl Jones or somebody to be in here reading some of those things you just read. It would be far more powerful than we can convey. Um, so let's talk about part one 
Uh, so as Janice said, the the preface is to mem- to all members, uh, whether in public practice, in industry, or retired or between jobs. Uh, and so those principles are really the the governance and the guiding ideas behind uh, the actual the nuts and bolts that are in each of the three sections we're going to talk about briefly here. So part one is for members in public practice. The document clearly defines uh, that those are individuals who work. Um, in, in an accounting firm or in a governmental agency or governmental audit firm. Uh, so it's it, this is what I think if you were to go back and look at the code of four and five years ago and, and long before that, um, it felt like almost the entire thing was specific to members in public practice. So while this this threats and safeguards concept is is new and clearer and better in this version, a lot of the things that are discussed in the the part one uh, are really consistent with what was in the previous version of the code. Uh, Janice will talk in a few minutes about part two. That's all the new stuff. Same theory, same ideas, uh, but the old version didn't really talk about those who were not in public practice. It was very narrow to uh, to individuals in public accounting. Um, and, the, and the point about governmental auditors, I think, is important as well. Uh, the, the fact that uh, the GAO has its own rules and requirements, uh, the AICPA wanted to be very clear that uh, CPAs who are working in that environment are not exempt from this because that governs them as well. So it is very clear that, uh, that you're also bound by Part 1 if you're in a, a governmental audit organization. So similar things we've already talked about, identify threats, evaluate the significance of that threat, and identify and apply your safeguards. Janice has already gone through that. Uh, that idea of an acceptable level is something that will be, uh, will be variable depending on who you are, where you work, what the situation is. Uh, I think it's it's a call a spade a spade kind of thing. If you realize that you're trying to justify something's acceptable and you have to force yourself to justify it, it's not. That $20 senator's ticket for Janice is, is certainly very justifiable as a acceptable level of a threat. Um, but if you're in an organization where that, that entertainment would be viewed differently, um, you, you can't try and overcome that. It is what it is. Uh, and I think we all have a different level, different line. Uh, but we need to know what that is and, and where we cross it. So let's talk about the threat. So Janice and I have both thrown out that that word a number of times, threats and safeguards, right? So the threats are the things that you have to identify uh, and then evaluate as to how significant they might be. So in part one, the the document lays out over the course of about five pages uh, some details on the primary categories of threats, the seven broad categories that the executive committee is defined and things that if you're evaluating a potential risk, it, it will fall in, in all cases, I believe, to one of these seven buckets. So we're just going to take a minute and go through them. You'll find when Janice talks about part two, uh, you'll be missing one of these, uh, but I won't steal your thunder on that. It'll be kind of obvious, <laughs> Thanks, honestly. So let's first talk about the adverse interest threat, which is defined as the threat that a member will not act with objectivity because the member's interests are opposed to the client's interests. And I think important through this this next couple minutes is, is you'll hear me use the word the member's interests as opposed to the client's interests in all these areas. So that's the idea of a somebody in public accounting and the client that they're working with. Whereas when, when Janice goes through the next section, it's the member in the employing organization. So I work for somebody as opposed to being a, a client service provider relationship. So this, this adverse interest threat is things like uh, I have a client who uh, maybe has threatened to commence litigation because of something that happened in last year's audit or service providing, or uh, maybe I did a, a valuation in the prior year and it's being challenged and so I need a new, the next service comes up and there's this threat of litigation to try and recover what was lost and what they think I did wrong last year. Or quite honestly, um, the idea of, of a fee collection issue, uh, the idea of um, you know, a, a recovery of some sort that they're holding over my head. So the the adverse interest is I want to protect myself, right? And so as it's defined, if I have a, a threat that I'm facing where I might compromise my objectivity because uh, what I want the outcome of this scenario to be is opposite of what maybe my client is holding over my head, that's what we're getting at here. Litigation being the most um, the most frequent example that falls under that one. Advocacy threat is defined as a threat that a member will promote a client 
client's interest or a position to the point that his or her objectivity or independence is compromised. Uh, so great example there. There are there are processes and procedures to follow in doing a evaluation. Uh, if your client is in the midst of selling, uh, there is a there is an advocacy threat that I want I want my client to get top dollar. They've been a great client for a number of years. Uh, am I am I incented somehow? Not not financially, but just because I like these folks and they're great folks. Am I incented to modify the way I approach the valuation to try and increase the value of the company that they'll receive, uh, even if I know it's not quite right? Uh, or I'm doing forensic accounting, and I know that uh, there's some gray areas in in what I'm looking at, and I really want to maximize uh, the outcome for my client. Again, uh, I'm being their advocate, and I think uh, most clients would say that they want their their accounting firm to be their advocate, and most accounting firms would say, I want to be my client's advocate in all cases. Uh, where we cross a line and where we have to evaluate the threat is when we consider whether we're going to compromise our objectivity in order to be a better advocate for that client. And it does happen. Uh, familiarity threat. It. I noticed in that advocacy thread, it talks about endorsing a client's products or services. I, I certainly love and have a lot of clients that produce really great things, and I love their products, um, but I'm not out there publicly, and we're not as a firm advertising the greatest ever, this or that. Um, and I think that's where maybe you can start to cross the line. Yeah, very true. So the familiarity threat, defined as a threat that due to a long or close relationship with a client, a member will become too sympathetic to a client's interests or too accepting of the client's work or product. Uh, very simple. You you hope to enter into a long-term relationship every time, uh, whether you're on the, the business side, entering into a new relationship with a, an accounting firm as a service provider, or whether you're the accounting firm entering into a relationship with a new client. Uh, you want it to be a long relationship. You want it to be a close relationship. Uh, the concern is when you have had a good, long, uh, wonderful relationship with uh, with a client, and that causes you to to become too accepting of what they say, too accepting of what they put in front of you, uh, reconciliations that have things on them that maybe if it weren't the client that I know and trust so well, I might dig into and look at. Uh, maybe it's uh, it's calculations of reserves or estimates that maybe seem a little bit aggressive or a little bit inappropriate, but uh, you know, I've, I've gone out for dinner, I've gone to the beach with the, these folks and their families, uh, I've had such a wonderful went long... Went to the beach? You might have crossed the line <laughs> there, Mike. <laughs> Correct. If you go, if, if you get too close to somebody to the point where you accept what they say at face value, um, or you become so sympathetic to their interests, uh, much like advocacy, where I, I want I want what's best for my client, and so I'm going to go to bat for them. But but do I go too far? Uh, in this case, am I? Do I like these folks so much because of the relationship that I've built that I'm willing to compromise my objectivity in that area? So um, it can happen. It happens with long relationships. Often it can happen with a, a shorter relationship, but where a former individual from an accounting firm goes to work at the client. Uh, we had a relationship with that person when they worked here at uh, at the firm, and now they're over there at my client. Uh, I know how good they are, so I can trust everything they put in front of me uh, without without taking that extra step of saying, uh, frankly, they're on the other side now, and while I think they're smart and they're good, uh, I still need to treat them like I would treat anybody else who's on the other side of the table during the work that I'm doing. Management participation threat is the threat that a member will take the role of a client management or otherwise assume management responsibilities. Uh, we think of that often on the public accounting side as a non-attest service, uh, where I'm actually stepping into the role of management. Uh, and the idea there uh, very simply being that if you are going to be independent and objective, you can't also be a part of the processes and procedures and control structure at the client that you're supposed to be objective and independent from. Uh, so that idea that I'm taking on the role of client management in this extra thing they're asking me to do uh, is, is absolutely a threat. The safeguards um, can be designed around that, depending on what the participation is, uh, but certainly something to be aware of, uh, and there are things you can and can't do, and they're very clear. The self-interest threat is the threat that a member could benefit financially or otherwise from an interest in or relationship with a client or someone associated with a client. Uh, you know, any any anybody who has been through any basic uh, ethics training or uh, even even back years and years ago understands that you can't 
you can't invest in a client. You can't hold equity in a client. Uh, there's some real, real unique rules, particularly even in the benefit plan world, about investments in a client or investments in a fund that holds material investments in a client. Uh, all that is because of this idea of self-interest, and the self-interest threat simply says, uh, if I really, if I really give the right outcome on the service I'm providing, maybe the share value will go down and my investment becomes less valuable. Um, so I'm not going to benefit financially. So am I going to compromise my objectivity because of that interest I have? Um, happens also with family members. Um, we, you know, we, we hear and see examples of uh, somebody compromised their objectivity because their spouse was a, a, an executive in a client. And uh, had the right thing been done, the client's share value would have gone down. They probably would have lost their job. Uh, so that's the whole self-interest threat. Are, are my interests more important to me than doing the right thing with my client? Um, Self-review threat, pretty straightforward. That's the threat that a member will not appropriately evaluate the results or previous judgment made um, and rely on things that perhaps we did. So, for instance, a client uh, asks us to do bookkeeping for them and, and we're on the public accounting side. We can do that bookkeeping, uh, but then when we go to do the tax return, um, we're becoming very reliant on the bookkeeping that we did for them. And if there's something that's not right in that um, a, are we asking the right questions because we did it? And B, are we willing to admit we might have done it wrong in the first place and it needs to be mm-hmm. fixed? So that idea of reviewing our own work uh, is one that's significant and, and worth discussion. The last one is undue influence. Uh, the undue influence threat is the threat that a member will subordinate his or her judgment to an individual associated with a client or a third party. So um, the there's two pretty significant examples. Uh, one is... Um, I'm going to fire you, right? You've been my audit and tax firm for eight years. Uh, You're giving me an answer I don't like. I know I pay you a lot of money. Everybody thinks they pay us a lot of money. Um, I know I pay you a lot of money, and, and I'm going to fire you if you don't change your opinion on that. So that's that undue influence. The other example is is just the bully mentality. Uh, there are folks who have very strong personalities, and there are folks who have very weak personalities. And it falls absolutely under this undue influence threat if you have someone with an incredibly strong personality pushing to get an answer that is different from what you might think is the correct one. Uh, and that's where a, a threat needs to be evaluated, safeguards need to be looked at, and ultimately uh, we have to do what's right regardless of, uh, again, I'll use the term the, the bully mentality on the other side of the table. Um, we still have to go through with what's right and deal with the consequences thereof. So those are the threats, um, and I think not to have taken the whole time, but uh, I think mm-hmm. that'll hopefully help Janice's part go a little quicker on the threats on the the part two of the, the book. Uh, so the safeguards, right? So we talked about the threats that we have to evaluate. We talk about the significance of those threats, and let's say we identify those threats or a combination thereof as significant. What are the safeguards that are in place to make sure – Um, that I can make a good decision on whether I can proceed with the service I'm providing. I'm not going to read through all these. The the actual document has a few pages worth of safeguards, uh, but there are things like as on your screen. There are safeguards that are created by the profession. So these are things like um, I have to get continuing professional education. I have to get certain amounts of credits in ethics every year. That's a safeguard so that I understand how to navigate through these things. There are, in public accounting, uh, since we're on part one, there are external reviews of the firm's quality control system. There's a peer review. There's internal reviews and an internal inspection fashion. So the profession demands that we do certain things to evaluate the systems in place at accounting firms uh, to make sure that we have certain safeguards in place to prevent us from crossing a line. There are safeguards implemented by a client. Um, a lot of our clients have have some bright lines on what they will and won't do with the accounting firm, and so that prevents us from uh, maybe impairing our independence by asking them to that senator's game when it's important to them, even though we didn't think it was that big of a number. Uh, so they'll have things, policies, and procedures put in place. Clients have... Um, 
commitments in place and things that their employees sign. They have um, relationship standards with service providers. So those are things that help. We certainly can't rely just on things that our clients are doing to make sure that we do the right thing. So I think the most important and probably the lengthiest list uh, of safeguards that Mm -hmm. need to be considered. I'm just looking at it. It actually goes A through Z. They haven't added any. uh, (laughs) They haven't gotten into double A, double B yet. I'm familiar with that, Mike. But they actually go A to Z. uh, So there are a significant number of safeguards that should be implemented by the public accounting firm. And they're things like quality control documents and trainings. They're uh, partner rotations, quality review partners involved in things, independence committees. Our firm has an independence committee that considers all of these questions that come up over the course of a year and make sure we're giving the right interpretations. Uh, It's designating a partner in charge of quality control and a partner in charge of the audit practice to make sure they're overseeing the things that we're doing. Uh, It's things like making sure that we have a, a, a secondary resource if if we're doing a service that maybe is is something we only have one or two people in the firm that are really good at, do we have a secondary resource to do a quality review of that to make sure that we're not entering into something that we want to be an advocate for our client, but there might be a little thing that we're missing, a really unique tax interpretation or a gap interpretation in a strange area. Uh, so there's a lot of safeguards. I, I would invite as you go through this, and I, I'd, I'd love an email if you take me up on this, but I'd love you to go through and actually read the safeguards and understand what kinds of things uh, accounting firms in this case should be doing to put safeguards in place that you can navigate through if you identify significant threats to your objectivity and independence. As I think of the safeguards implemented by the client, Mike, I know a lot of our engagement letters where we are assisting the clients with their footnotes or things of that nature that we identify an individual at management with suitable skill, knowledge, and experience, which is mentioned in the code here, to oversee that service and actually be able to do a thorough review of the work that we have done. I see that with tax revisions as well. Um, And we make sure that is one of the safeguards. And then another one that um, I always think of with implemented by the client is tone at the top. Mm-hmm. So how are they leading? What are their policies and procedures? What are their ethical guidelines and what are they following? So I definitely think of those two when there are safeguards implemented by the client. All right. Um, as we wrap up part one here for members in public practice, we have some of the rules and interpretations, which we focus on integrity and objectivity. Um, so this focuses a lot on conflicts of interest. So when you look here, you see director positions. I mean, certainly I think a board of directors or um, boards at different clients, we certainly cannot have anyone at the firm who would sit on those or they could not be an attest client. We would certainly not be independent. Um, Mike and I talked a lot about gifts and entertainment. Where do you cross that line? What are the thresholds? What would a reasonable third party, knowing all the facts, conclude about that? So you certainly have to think about those gifts and entertainment. Um, And in terms of integrity and objectivity, could there be knowing misrepresentations of facts or information? Are you willing to skew that information? We'll talk about some of the business side um, on the next slide as we look at those threats to the business side. Um, So when you look at that integrity and objectivity, they talk in a lot of the examples about representing clients on opposite sides of a transaction. So you can't represent two organizations on two sides of a potential acquisition or two different sides of a litigation or valuations or things of that nature. So you got to make sure that you're you know, remaining loyal to your client, not crossing any of these lines or any of these threats, um, but maintaining your integrity and objectivity. The second area to touch on is independence, so a very large section of part one. So a lot of general matters there and a lot of network firms. So are you part of a network of firms? How do you share in that responsibility, liability? Who needs to be independent? But it talks a lot about non-attest services. So we have a lot of discussions about that with our clients. Are we doing tax returns? Are we doing tax provisions? Are we helping prepare those financial statements? And what are that? That is absolutely a threat. And how are we evaluating that threat? And what are the safeguards that have been put in place? So we list quite a few other things here. I mean, unpaid fees. Fortunately, we don't have to have that discussion too often, but it does happen occasionally. We can't have last year's fees outstanding or we're no longer independent because the company owes us money. So we had to make sure that those fees are not hanging out there from the prior year. Um, Financial interests, trustee responsibilities. We certainly cannot be a trustee or that would violate our independence. Um, 
It, that section has a lot of, and you see it's 67 pages long, as we talked about, <laughs> independence being the most significant component of the code. Um, there's a lot of specific examples. If, if you were to go back to, again, that old version of the code, that's what you would have seen a lot of. A lot of specific interpretations. If this situation, here's the rule. Um, there's a lot of good things in that that section to consider if you identify a threat. It might be one that's very clearly spelled out. Um, but then if it's not, which there are an awful lot of nuances to every situation, right? Um, so if it's not, that's where we go back to that threats and safeguards and start to think more conceptually. Um, but it, it's great if, if you come across a, a concern and an issue, uh, and it's one of the many things on these 67 pages, your answer is generally going to be pretty clear. Either you can or you can't, or you can, but here's the specific safeguards that must be in place. Uh, so a lot of really good information for those in public practice in those 67 pages. Mm-hmm. Yeah, certainly I see family relationships, a lot of rules surrounding that. And certainly a partner can't have a spouse working at an organization where you're providing at test services. That's pretty clear. But you know, what if a key contact at a client, want, like they're their spouse or sibling wants to work for your firm. The firms have to evaluate that and, and that could get pretty sticky. So how does that need to work? And you need to go through the framework and look at the threats and the safeguards. The last area here, are other areas with interpretations. Um, so there's a lot of things listed here. I mean, two I look at are the confidential information. Um, so they're very clear there that that can be information obtained through your employment activities, so us working at the firm or even um, volunteer activities as well, for those of you who volunteer in the community and on other boards. Um, I also look at acts discreditable, so discrimination, harassment, failure to file a tax return or or pay your taxes, um, negligence in financial statement prep, and they go into whether that's you being negligent and not preparing correctly or you directing someone else to skip a step or don't book that entry or skew this a little bit. All of those things fall into those other areas. So that concludes part one, which no surprise, that took up a large chunk of our presentation today. So as we go through through about the next 10 minutes of the presentation, um, we'll touch base on part two, members in business. And as we said, it's structured very similar to part one. But if you, you'll see the same thing here for, I think, the fourth time in our slides, identify threats, evaluate the significance of the threat, and identify and apply safeguards. So I'm going to just take a moment. I'm not going to spend nearly the time that Mike did, but flip back to what those threats actually are and talk about them in the context of members in business. So when you think of adverse interest, some of the examples they lay out in there is, you know, if you're suing your employer because you feel there's been harassment or some wrongdoing done to you, you may not be able to be independent and objective, even though you're a member in business. And here's where they really focus on objectivity. In terms of the advocacy, I mean, you work for this company, you want them to do well. There could be a prospectus or an offering or a press release or even just reporting your earnings to the bank. Um, or could you mislead them slightly? Could you, you know, change some of those reserves, hit your targets that we talked about before? Um, could you be really close on the covenants and you don't want to create problems for the company? So, well, you know, what's a $20,000 accrual here or something of that nature to make sure you just make it? So you need to think all of those. They are certainly advocacy threats. And if you're willing to bend any of the rules or skew those numbers, um, you need to seriously think about what you're doing. And I think one that's come up um is the, the idea that um, a, a merger and acquisition environment, and you know that if you give, if you word the answer to your question wrong, there's going to be a red flag for the acquirer and your, your organization might not get through the deal. The family that owns the company that's been paying you for years um, may not get the value they want. And so it's a, that whole idea of um, maybe I don't lie, maybe I don't Maybe I don't change numbers and commit financial reporting fraud, but if I don't answer that completely truthfully, that's really best for those folks. And so I I might do that. Uh, So it's it's gray. It's very gray, but it's one of those things that I think happens more often than we than we think it does. There's the familiarity threat applied to members in business. So you think of family relationships. Are you working with family members? Some organizations don't have that. I work with a lot of family owned businesses. So how good is your governance? How good is your tone at the top? But certainly that familiarity. And that also plays into vendor gifts and things we talked about before. 
Uh, management participation is the one that does not apply because you are generally part of management. So the self-interest threat. So when you think of financial reporting and the numbers and what you're doing in your job, could that affect your bonus? Could that affect your investment in the company if you have stock options or phantom stock or it's an ESOP or something of that nature? So how are you maintaining your objectivity in that case? Um, the self-review threat, um, a lot of the examples in here they go through is internal audit work. So a couple of years ago, you went out there, you did these same tests, you, caught, you had an issue with it, you elevated it, it became this huge problem. Everybody was upset. Nothing was ultimately done about it. It was sort of dismissed. You go out there and you find the exact same thing again. And maybe you pause and say, geez, do I want to go through all that again? Nothing's going to happen. So you have to really think about that because you need to report what you're finding and you need to always be doing the right thing. Um, undue influence. So could you be providing misleading information or bad financials? Or as Mike said, it, the bully mentality is someone bullying you or are you bullying someone else to get the answers that you want? So certainly all of these threats apply to part two and to the members in business. Now, I like the the undue influence threat uses uh, a, a key word that I, I think is it really resonates. And in all four examples they give in the code, it says the first four words are a member is pressured. A member is pressured <laughs> to do this, is pressured to do that. And that's really what the undue influence threat is. And that's, I think, when you when you hear mostly about financial reporting fraud, particularly in the public world, there's always somebody who was complicit to the fraud who said, well, my boss made me do it. They were going to fire me if I didn't do it. And that's that idea of uh, I'm being pressured to do something. And if I didn't toe the line and do what they wanted me to do, my job was at risk. My bonus was at risk. I, I, I couldn't afford to do it. Um, but I love that that every one of the examples they give starts with a member is pressured to. And that's really what it's all about. Yeah. yeah you don't want to be receiving that pressure or putting that pressure on anyone else. So I'm getting us back to where we were in our slides as we go through the second slide on members in business and we focus on integrity and objectivity. So we've talked a lot about conflicts of interests, um, gifts and entertainment as well, whether you're giving them or receiving them. We also talked about examples of knowing mis misrepresentations of information and kind of how gray that can be if you're tweaking something just a little or looking at that estimate a little more closely. Um, and then is there any subordination of judgment? So are you willing to put that aside and move on and maybe just do what you're told or do what you think is in the best interest of the organization? And there are several other rules we list there, and we will talk about acts discreditable in the last section. So the last section of the code is part three, other members, those retired between employment and other. So this focuses a lot on acts discreditable to the profession. I've mentioned a bunch of these, but they talk about discrimination or harassment um, in employment practices, solicitation um, or disclosure of CPA exam questions and answers. Hopefully no one would do that. Failure to file a tax return or pay a tax liability or disclosure of confidential information. And I think that's any confidential information. I think it's important to remember when maybe you're serving on your church finance committee or you're serving on a nonprofit board that all of that information is confidential and you need to make sure you're, you're protecting all of that and everything that you do. And I, just to be clear, and this was specified pretty clearly when the new code came out, failure to file a tax return or pay a tax liability is an acts discreditable. That doesn't mean it's okay to, it, it doesn't say failure to file a tax return if you owe a tax liability. <laughs> so this this mentality that I, I heard once um, <laughs> that existed that said, well, I'm just getting money back, I'm overpaid, so I'm, I'll file it when I get around to it. It's not really an ethics issue if I don't file it because I'm overpaid is still an acts discreditable. It's failure to file timely, not just failure to file forever. It's failure to file timely. Even if they owe you money back, you got to get it done by the due date. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Mike. So we're going to move on. Mike, you got about five so minutes. For the, and this is a, a real quick section that uh, we put in at the end. Uh, just to talk about the process. So the joint ethics enforcement program, uh, I'm a Jeep guy. I love Jeeps. So I'm just going to call it Jeep. Uh, the, the Jeep program is an arrangement where uh, recognizing that there is the, the AICPA, the American Institute, and there are numerous state societies uh, that each hold their members accountable for certain ethics uh, levels. Uh, 
but they're generally the same. Most states will adopt the AICPA's Code of Professional Conduct as their state rules. Some will modify them in certain areas. Uh, but this idea that if you violate a, an ethics requirement in your home state, you're also violating it uh, at the, the AICPA level, and you are likely a member of both. So now we have two separate enforcement processes to, to hold someone accountable for the same rules. Uh, so the, the Jeep program, the, the G program, the Jeep, was put in place uh, really to say, let's adjudicate it once and let's get all the facts and circumstances put together and let's work together as a state society and a national uh, organization to make sure that we get the right answer um, for this individual and what they did. Uh, so summary of the process, uh, real brief, uh, when a complaint is filed, and a complaint does not have to be filed by any one person in particular, it can be filed by a member of either a state society or a member of the AICPA, or it can be filed by a non-member, a member of the public at large. A complaint can come from a another entity, federal, state, local government, uh, the Department of Labor, the IRS, uh, any, there, there's numerous ways complaints can be filed, but once they get into the system, um, the process is is pretty straightforward. Uh, the the reviewer does an initial inquiry and analysis, gets some basic questions answered. Um, if they find that the the allegation is against someone who is not a member, so uh, somebody who is not a member of the AICPA or state society, uh, then they're they're almost powerless at that point because it is a society um, process. And so then it becomes a, a whole different process that we're not getting into. Uh, investigators assigned, investigator does their due diligence, um, asks their questions, does their interviews. And once the, the investigator determines that they have identified a specific violation of the code of conduct, they have ample evidence and understanding of what that violation was, uh, then the case is presented to a committee, and the committee casts a vote to determine what the outcome is uh, on that particular case. So there's a couple different outcomes you can have. Uh, one is uh, no violation, and that's probably not getting to the committee level. Uh, that's where the investigator does their homework and their due diligence and realizes that, uh, well, on the surface, maybe there was some merit to the complaint that caused it to go beyond just the initial phase. Uh, there's really no evidence of a violation. The case is closed. Uh, and then we escalate from there. There's a required corrective action. Um, this is the one that I always chuckle at. You you knowingly violated an ethics requirement, and so go get trained on ethics. Um, I'm not sure how much that helps, but it is important to understand the rules. Maybe you didn't understand the rules you were supposed to live by. Maybe you didn't pay attention during that one-hour McConley and Asbury webinar that went through <laughs> exactly where all that information can be found and how to find it and interpret it. Um, so go take more training. Uh, the, the next level, more significant, would be a settlement agreement. Uh, and it's a non-negotiable settlement that's put in front of uh, the recipient. Uh, and that could be a, a suspension. It could be a monetary fine. It could be a number of different things. Uh, if, the, uh, if the individual does not agree to the settlement agreement that's put forth, then it would go to a joint trial board uh, where a, a, a joint committee or a panel will determine whether the individual is guilty, not guilty, etc. Uh, they can expel or suspend uh, the individual's membership. They can take further action. They can uh, Monetary fines can come out of this. So there's a number of outcomes if it gets to the joint trial board. Uh, certainly not something I want to belabor the point on because I'm hopeful that uh, those in our audience uh, we'll never have to navigate the process, and if if by chance you do, uh, your first phone call should be to a good attorney who understands the way the uh, AICPA process works and can uh, help navigate through that with you as you, you take your medicine for what you did. Thank you once again for joining us for this webinar recap produced by McConley and Asbury. We hope you join us for all of our future webinars and you can stay connected to us and learn more about all of our upcoming events by visiting www.macpas.com. Thanks again and have a great day.